thank you all for coming this evening. We're, we've got a rich topic to look at tonight. We're going to look at the atonement, so the work of Christ on the cross. Now, it's sort of part of a two-parter, so when we come back after the summer in September, we're going to look at the ongoing work of Christ. So we're going to look at the resurrection, the ascension, and his role as an intercessor for us. So that'll be in September. We don't have a session in August, so that'll, that'll be in September. But yeah, we're going to look at the atonement, so the work of Christ on the cross tonight. And when I was thinking about the word atonement, when, when you think of someone atoning for something, it's normally that they've done something wrong, and therefore they have to try and atone for what they've done wrong. Whereas the biblical version of the atonement is the opposite of that. And it really has stunned me when I stopped and thought about it, because we've done something wrong, and yet it is Christ atoning for us. That is bonkers, really, isn't it? That we've committed horrific sins that have separated us from God, and yet God has made atonement for us. That's what we're going to be looking at, and we're going to look at, that in, we're going to look at it in various different ways. I'm going to look at it in five different ways. Think of this as when a, a goal is scored in a football match, and you have the camera, still the different camera angles looking at the same thing, and hopefully we're going to see from different perspectives how glorious the atonement is. So we're going to look at it from different angles, all pointing us to exactly the same thing just want to give you a couple of definitions of the atonement, which should be on the screen or on your handout, I hope. Maybe the next one. Yeah, there's a typo in the first sentence, by the way. It should say, the way in which Christ repairs the broken relationship between man and God. That's a really nice sort of simple way of looking at what it is. So the way in which Christ repairs the broken relationship between man and God. Uh, the second definition, which is a bit more uh, meaty, it's the work of God in Christ through Christ's obedience and death and resurrection, by which he cancelled the debt of our sin, removed or absorbed the holy wrath of God against us, and secured for us all the benefits of salvation, even eternal life. This is the atonement, the work of Christ to achieve all of this. And that's what we're going to spend some time looking at this evening. So shall we pray before we get into this? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we have the privilege of coming around your word this evening to see what it is that you've done for us to make atonement for our sins. Lord, we're only going to skim the surface this evening because it is such a deep, rich topic. We thank you and we praise you for what we've done. And Lord, I pray that the response from this tonight would be worship, that we had come away with hearts that love you more, that want to serve you more, because we see how incredible what you've done for us is. So Lord, I just pray that you would touch our hearts this evening, that it wouldn't just be dry theology, but this would stir our souls so that we love you more. In your mighty name, amen. So we're going to look at the, the atonement from five different perspectives tonight. There are more that we could look at. I, I figured you guys might want to have your tea at some point. So we're just going to look at it from five different ways this evening. There should be a list there. So the first one is called penal substitution. Then we'll look at justification, redemption, uh, propitiation, and reconciliation. That'll take us up to the break. And then we're going to look at the scope of the atonement in the second half, which is where perhaps things get a little bit more controversial. We'll look at who the atonement was for, and we'll look at some of the key ideas on this. So that's the plan for the evening. So penal substitution first. It splits up into two words. Penal meaning Christ endured punishment and substitution. He endured that punishment in our place. He came on instead of us to take the punishment that we deserve, like a football match where a player goes off and another player goes on. It should have been us on the cross, but instead Christ was our substitute. He took our place on the cross, and he acted as a representative on behalf of the redeemed people of Christ. He acted on our behalf on the cross, taking our punishment. It's a glorious truth, isn't it? Penal substitution, Christ taking the punishment that our sins deserve in our place. But it does raise some objections, which we're going to have a little look at. It's always useful to look at some of the objections that people might have in case you're having these kind of conversations with people. So someone might say, how is it fair that Christ's suffering, which was limited to a certain period of time, maybe about 12 hours from the beginning of the flogging through to his actual crucifixion. How is that fair that his sort of 12 hours of suffering can cancel out an eternity of hell? 
that might be an objection that someone might have. To counter that, we would have to look at the infinite value of, the, of Christ, the infinite value of who he is for him to go through that on our behalf. You know, his infinite value, his glory, his majesty, taking our place on the cross. Therefore, the cross wasn't just sort of 12 hours subjected to a normal person. It was subjected to the most powerful, the most beautiful, the most valuable person in the whole universe. So I don't think that first objection can stand because of who Christ is enduring the cross for us. And secondly, is it unjust that an innocent party should suffer? Christ was innocent. He didn't deserve anything of what he got on the cross. And yet the guilty, that is us, go free. It, it, it is unjust is the answer to that. But that is what grace is, isn't it? It's incredible love that we don't deserve. Yes, it is unjust that that happens, but God's grace is utterly incredible. And some people might say in penal substitution, is the cross an extreme form of child abuse, the father pouring out his wrath on the son? Well, if we think of God as Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they were all in agreement on the plan ahead of the whole universe being made. This was not just the, the father subjecting the son to the cross. This was a plan that they all were in on from before time. So therefore, it's not an extreme form of child abuse. It is just infinite grace that is given to us. That would be how I would try and look at those three questions. So that's the first one, penal substitution. Christ is our substitute. He takes the penalty that we deserve. The second term is justification. Now, justification is a legal term. It's a, it's a change of status in a courtroom. So you could argue, I think uh, Packer writes that it is a judicial act of God in pardoning sinners. Now, some people have said that uh, justification is just as if we have never sinned. And that doesn't quite go far enough, I don't think. It is true. It is just as if we have never sinned, but it doesn't go far enough. Because on the cross, all of our sin, all of our muckiness, all of our horrible things that we have done in our lives get imparted to Christ. He takes all of them, but it's not just one way. We take all of his holiness, all of his righteousness. We get it. What an incredible exchange that that is. So it's not just that it's as if we've never sinned. It's we getting all of Christ's righteousness into our account. We see that in Romans 5. So justification is by grace alone. It is a complete gift. Now, justification by faith alone was a big sticking point back in the 1600s, 1700s, when there was the Reformation away from the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church was sort of teaching a more legalistic gospel that you had to earn your way back to God. And the reformers came along and said, no, it is justification by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. So when we are justified, it is a gift. There's nothing that we can do to earn our justification. It is simply by grace, by God's grace, and it is only through Christ alone. And then with justification, it is simply to the glory of God alone as well. God gets all the glory when he saves sinners. And the great news of justification is that we are now eternally secure if we are in Christ. We have an eternal security because we have been justified. Our legal status has changed. We are no longer guilty. Our sin no longer condemns us, but we are made alive in Christ. We are now made alive in him. So that's justification. It's a legal term. So when you see that in the Bible, when you read through, don't just skip over it. It is a glorious term, isn't it? The, all these are terms that you'll see if you're reading through the Bible, and we mustn't just skip over them because they contain incredible truths, absolutely incredible. So justification. And then we move on to the third way of looking at what Christ did, which is redemption. Now, redemption is a transactional term. So you might go down to Tesco and redeem your coupons. They are useless in your wallet until you go and redeem them. It's a kind of a business term, isn't it? To be redeemed or to redeem something. So a definition of redemption could be it is our rescue by ransom. It is the paying of a price that freed us from the jeopardy of guilt, from the enslavement to sin and the expectation of wrath. 
You see, we were slaves to our sinful nature. Now, if you're a slave to something, there's nothing you can do about it until you are redeemed, until you have those chains broken. We were slaves to our sin, but we have been redeemed. We have been purchased by Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says that you are not your own. You were bought with a price. You know, we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are not our own. We belong to him. In Galatians chapter 4, uh, verse 4 and 5 and 6, sorry, it reads, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. See the change that takes place there. We were slaves to the law, but we have been adopted as sons of God. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And in Colossians chapter 1, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. You know, we were slaves, we were chained up, we were tied up in our sinful nature. We were hostages and we could do nothing about it. But Christ has paid our ransom. He has redeemed us. He has delivered us. He has broken our chains. So we are no longer slaves to our sin, but we have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light because what of Jesus has done. It's a drastic change, isn't it? It's not an in-between state. We have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. So we are no longer slaves to our sin. We are no longer slaves to the law, but we have been redeemed. It's incredible terms. And then we arrive at propitiation. Mainly you'll find propitiation in the ESV version of the Bible. It's I think the best translation, not that I'm a real expert on on, on Greek or anything like that, but from what I know, it is a very good translation of the word. We need to think about what propitiation is. Seems to have gone off the screen, so never mind. With propitiation, we have to factor in who God is. So God is just and God is holy. And as a consequence, he cannot stand sin. If we think of who he is, he cannot tolerate or stand, stand, stand sin because it would be incompatible with him. So there is the wrath of God that is poured out on sin because of who Christ is. So you've got this wrath of God, which is shown in the picture here, and you've got humanity that would have experienced the force of it, but then you've got the cross of Christ in between. And that's what propitiation is. It's the diversion of the wrath of God away from, away from us and on to Christ. What an incredible word that is. You know, that wrath should have been for us. But if we are in Jesus Christ, he has taken the wrath for us in our place. What a brilliant word it is. More than just a word. In Hebrews 2, verse 17, it reads, Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. You see, our sin had to be dealt with. God is holy. God is just. He cannot just let sin slide, but it was punished in the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross in our place. In Romans 3, verse 25, it reads, Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. And in 1 John 4, verse 10, it reads, This is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So what did it mean for Christ to be uh, taking this punishment on the cross? It is more than just the physical pain of the cross. We look at the cross and we think that must have been unbearably painful to have taken that Roman flogging and then nailed to the cross. 
But it was way more than that. It was experiencing the full wrath of the Father on himself. It involved separation of Jesus from the Father. They'd been joined for all eternity and then separated on the cross. It was more than just the physical pain. It was Christ experiencing the wrath of the Father on himself. And he did this willingly for us. How incredible is this? And the last term is reconciliation. Now, in propitiation, the wrath of the Father is diverted away from us and onto Christ. Now, if propitiation was on its own, we would be neutral with God. Our sins would no longer stand against us, but we would be neutral. Whereas reconciliation is a step further, isn't it? We are now reconciled back to God. Let me just read a couple of passages uh, that show us this. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, it reads, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. See, that's where we were when we were in our sin. We were alienated from God, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. But in verse 22, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. We have now been reconciled to the Father because of the blood of Christ. And we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as well. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him, that is Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So we are reconciled to Christ, and we have a job to do, and that is to try and present the gospel to people to help them become reconciled to Christ as well. That is our work to do. We must implore people to be reconciled to God. It, nothing could be more important for us to do. So we have now been reconciled to God and he now views us as holy and blameless. In him, we have become the righteousness of God. It's that great exchange that we looked at earlier. He takes all of our muckiness, all of our sin, and we get all of his righteousness. We get to wear it. He takes all of our mucky rags, all of our mucky clothes, and we wear his beautiful white clothes of righteousness. We have been justified. Our legal status has changed. We are no longer guilty, but we are innocent because of what Christ has done. And that is just a snapshot of the atonement. It really is beautiful when we stop and reflect on what Christ has done for us. And as we go into the break in the middle, I want us to think about a few passages in the, in the Bible. The list should be up on the screen or on the handout. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, very, very famous verse. Uh, Romans 8, 32. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 14 and 15. I want you to have a look at those passages and have a think about them. Do these passages imply that one day everyone will be saved? You know, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Does that imply that everyone will one day be saved? And then I've got a few other verses for you to have a look at. Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, 1 Peter 1 verses 1 to 2, Romans, 28, 9, uh, Romans 8, 29 to 30, and Ephesians 1, 3 and 4. Now, when you look at these passages, do they imply that Christ's death is limited to some people and not to others? And that's what we're going to be discussing after the break. So grab yourself a cup of tea or a coffee and some biscuits. Have a good chat about these, and then we'll start again in about 20 minutes or so. All right?
Right. Am I on? Yes. Yes. Is Rob back doing what he does best? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, I hope you all had a, a good discussion in the break. I hope that was helpful, interesting. A lot of the time when we come across issues like this, it's quite useful to have thought things through, especially for things like apologetics. So you, the kind of conversations you can have with non-Christians where they will have many different kind of objections and, and, and stuff like that. And it's good to have thought through some of the bigger issues so that you can have that conversation and so you can defend aspects of the faith. Um, the first one then that we were looking at were passages such as John 3.16, Romans 8, and 2 Corinthians 5. And they could be presented as arguments for something called universalism, which is the idea that Christ died with the intention of, tone, of atoning for everyone without exception, and that through his saving work on the cross, everyone will be saved. So John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So I think the key word that uh, universalists would pull out would be God so loved the world and that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In Romans 8, 32, it says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now, the context here is this is a letter written to a church. So when he says uh, God gave him up for us all, Paul here is writing to a specific church. So he's talking about everyone all within the church. So it's not universal in the sense of the whole world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, uh, it, it, it reads, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The context here, Paul's writing about being in union with Christ. So Christ died for all who are in union with him. So it's so important when we look at verses like this to look at the context of them and not just treat them as isolated passages. But also we have to look at scripture as a whole because we can't have contradictions in scripture. If we find something that we think is contradicting another scripture, it's probably because we've interpreted it wrong because there are no contradictions in scripture. For instance, in Matthew 25 verse 46, and it says, then they will go away to eternal punishment but the righteous to eternal life. How can everyone be saved if that is true? In 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verses 8, and 8 to 10, it says, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. So when we look, to, look at scripture as a whole, it seems really evident that not everyone will be saved. So I think we can be safely rule out the idea of universalism, that everyone will one day be saved. However, we still have a problem, perhaps. Who will be saved then? And we arrive at some different models. I'm going I'm to try and run through these. I'm going to try and present them more in a way that will let you think about them for yourselves. And I'll try and put less of my opinion on this because it can get quite opinionated quite quickly with these topics. So the first one we'll look at is something called hypothetical universalism. Now, that's a tongue twister, isn't it? Hypothetical universalism. So let me read what this is. Christ's death made salvation possible for everyone. So everyone has the possibility of salvation. But actual, so it actually only happens for those who add to it a response of faith and repentance that was not secured by it. So the atonement was for all or possible for all, but it's only realized for those who response, uh, respond in faith. So that's univer uh, hypothetical universalism, which is somewhat similar to Arminianism, which is named after a guy, one of the eight great theologians who uh, has spent a lot of time thinking about this called Arminius. And Arminianism is the idea that Christ died with the intention of saving all people. But we know that not everyone is saved. 
Therefore, Christ did not secure an actual atonement on the cross, but a sort of provisional atonement. Uh, So the atonement he secures is conditional and dependent on the faith of the believer. So it's quite similar to hypothetical universalism. Uh, So to put this another way, Christ's death permits the Father to forgive all who repent and believe. So it's sufficient for all, but it's only realized or brought to fruition for those who do respond in faith. So we can call this provisional atonement. That might be another way of looking at it if if Arminianism is a bit complicated to pronounce. But provisional atonement, it is available for all, but it is only actual for those who come to Christ in repentance. The problem that strikes my mind with this, if we are saying that God's uh, provision is for all, but it only comes to reality for those who respond in faith, is you could argue that God is rolling the dice with this. And it's basically saying, those who, by their own merits, come to Christ and respond in faith will be saved. So is God rolling the dice with these models and saying, well, actually, I'm leaving this over to you guys. Those who respond in faith will be saved and those who don't won't. That would be my possible issue with these models. I don't like the idea of God rolling the dice with anything, which it does sort of feel like it does when it comes down to be putting on to us to respond in faith which then takes us to limited atonement. Now, you may have heard this called as Calvinism before, based after John Calvin. I feel a bit sorry for John Calvin, because John Calvin was a brilliant theologian, wrote loads of incredible stuff, and everyone remembers him for this one thing, looking at Calvinism, whereas actually his theology is amazing if you look at the, greater, the bigger picture, but everyone just thinks of Calvinism when you think of John Calvin. But anyway, uh, Calvinism, or limited atonement, and when we say limited... Doesn't that sound negative as well? It's sort of limiting the atonement, which it really isn't limited in that sense. Uh, But the death of Christ in in limited atonement actually put away the sins of all of God's elect and ensured that they would be brought to faith through regeneration and then kept in faith for glory. And that is what it was intended to achieve. That's from, from Packer. So in other words, God chooses a people for himself and He makes sure those people come to faith. He calls us if we are God's elect. And the passages that they would go to for Calvinism could be Romans 28, uh, sorry, Romans 8, 29 to 30. Let's have a look at that one, Romans 8. I'm not sure if that one actually is, yeah. Yeah. So for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So we're seeing words like predestined and called as if that there are certain people who were chosen ahead of time. And that's what Calvinism or limited atonement is getting at, that there is a group of people that were chosen ahead of time to be saved. It's not just a New Testament principle of limited atonement. If we look in the Old Testament, God chose for himself a people, Israel. Out of all the nations, he chose Israel as his nation. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, uh, so for you, that is Israel, are a, a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. So that when we look in scripture, there is quite a weighting of evidence for limited atonement. Also, we see it in Ephesians chapter 1 as well. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, when I've uh, had good chats with Neil about election and all this sort of stuff, this is the verse that Neil would go to. So I call this verse Nihilism as opposed to Calvinism. And he zooms in on verse 4. I'm sure if he was here tonight, he would tell us more about what he thinks on this. 
But in verse 4, even as he chose us in him, the key word there is chosen in him. So God chose Christ before the foundations of the world. And therefore, if we are in Christ, we were chosen in him before the foundations of the world. And that might be the best way to kind of marry these arguments up against each other. Just this verse here, I think, is really helpful for that. That God chose Christ before the foundations of the world. And therefore, if we are in Christ, we were chosen before the foundations of the world. So that, that could be the way of marrying these up, perhaps. It's a really helpful verse to go to there. But a lot of people would argue against limited atonement as well. You know, people view it as unfair. Why would God choose some people but not other people? You know, where, where's the fairness in that? Well, I would counter that argument by saying that is it fair that anyone is chosen? You know, none of us deserve God's grace. Absolutely none of us deserve it, do we? But it's a gift. So is it fair that God chooses some? Well, who are we to say what is fair in God's sight? You know. So those are the different viewpoints on who the atonement is for. I don't want to try and go too far down the rabbit hole with this, but that it's good to be aware of the different models, the different arguments for and against each one. I will leave it over to you guys to have a good think about what you think on this. But hopefully there are some things that we can all agree on, regardless of which side of the debate you sit on. And firstly, that the death of Christ is to be proclaimed to all without exception, as the, only and the, as the only and sufficient means of salvation. So regardless of what we think of who the atonement is for, we can all agree that the death of Christ and his salvation is to be proclaimed to all people without exception. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 10, it states that for this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the saviour of all people, especially of those who believe. So we believe that the gospel is to be proclaimed to all, regardless of our viewpoint on Calvinism, Arminianism. Everyone needs the gospel, and we have to proclaim it to everyone. Now, John Piper wrote on, on this um, topic. Now, John Piper, by the way, is a very uh, passionate Calvinist, but he writes this, which I think is really quite balanced on this. He says, in a sense, Christ dies for all, but not in the same sense for all. In the sense that he dies for all, we mean that he dies in such a way that you can offer his death to all without exception and say to them without any qualm, here is Christ. I offer Christ to you. If you will believe in Christ, it is yours. Everything he bought from the Father for eternal life, he bought for you if you will have it. And this will enable us to preach the gospel indiscriminately to every single person on the planet and say, this death will cover your sins if you believe it. You know, being a Calvinist does not mean we uh, <laughs> don't want to preach the gospel. We need to preach the gospel to all, and we can honestly proclaim the gospel to everyone. The gospel is for us all to proclaim to those around us. The atonement is sufficient for every single person on the planet. I found this really helpful. Because of Jesus' infinite worth, even if the whole world were to be saved, not just some people, but the whole world, if everyone in this world were to be saved, he wouldn't have to do any more work to achieve that atonement. Even if every single person were to be saved, he wouldn't have to do anything more to add to what he's done on the cross because of the infinite worth of Christ and what he did on the cross. We all need Jesus for our salvation, don't we? If we're not in union with Jesus Christ, then we are in union with Adam, which leads us to death because of our sin. We all need to be in union with Jesus Christ and trust in his salvation. We are chosen in Christ. That is a really glorious truth. I think that's a great place to kind of pull this together. Even as he chose us in him, we are chosen in Christ. We are adopted as sons and daughters of the king. We have now been reconciled to Jesus Christ because of his blood that was spilled. It's not, it's not that the anger has just been diverted away. We are now reconciled to God. We are heirs of an incredible inheritance if we are in Christ Jesus. How incredible is the atonement when we just take time just to look at it in different ways. When we see how rotten our sin is, but we see how much Christ suffered for us in our place. 
all of that wrath that should have been poured out on us was poured out on Christ. And therefore we are reconciled to him. I just want to close the evening by reading some lyrics from a, from a hymn that I absolutely love. It's To God Be the Glory. And it reads, To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. What a great summary of the atonement in that hymn. Shall we pray together as we close the evening? Yeah, Heavenly Father, we can't begin to comprehend what it cost you on the cross. We can't begin to comprehend the pain, the suffering, the anguish of having the wrath that should have been poured out on us, poured out on Christ, what it must have cost you. But Lord, we thank you. We give you all the glory. We praise you for what you did. And we thank you for what it has done for us, that we are now redeemed as your people, and that we have been purchased from our sinful nature. We've been brought from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Oh, we thank you that we have been reconciled to you through the blood that was spilled on the cross. Lord, help us when we are going through things in life that take us away from you, or it seems that we've been taken away, to look up and see who you are, to see what you've done. Help us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on you, whatever we're going through. And Lord, we have such good news. Help us to proclaim it to a world that is dying, to a world that is going in the wrong direction. Help us to show them how glorious the atonement is. Help us to be signposts to the world around so that they see how incredible you are and that they would see their need for a savior. Help us to see our sin for what it is. Help us to see how rotten it is, but how, how incredible your grace is that it can w cover over all of our sin. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In your mighty name, amen. And as I say, there's not a study next month. So the next one will be at the very beginning of September, right at the beginning of September. That is September the 4th, September the 4th. And we will be looking at the, the resurrection, the ascension, and the ongoing work of Christ as our intercessor. So that'll be in two months' time.